important to use a Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they are uh, an airplane mode and all devices are muted. Uh, I'll now uh, proceed through the agenda. Um, now, we haven't had any apologies, but uh, I presume Matthew and Paul are on their way. Uh, Jim, you want to make your declar declaration on the yep. bill? Yes, please. Okay. Chair, sorry, can I just, on that, on Jim's declaration, is it not a conflict of interest, no harm to Jim, but is it not a conflict of interest that he's in the meeting when we're going through the clauses? Uh, sorry, I'm just a new MLA, I've never done any of this before, so I'm just wondering. It's no, not. subject to confirmation of the clerk, it's not, because actually Jim has raised the bill as the sponsor of the bill as well as part of the committee. And we, through the Chair Chairperson's Liaisons Committee, took this as uh, the Finance Department will take this bill. So actually, it's not. So when we d when we're discussing it, because we're taking a collective view of the committee, not mm -hmm. just his view on, on when we're doing our piece. Am I correct on that, Jim? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, just to, to add to that, obviously, obviously the, uh, unless uh, the member is acting as the bill sponsor mm -hmm. and providing evidence to the committee, then the, the member has no. A other rights than any other member of the committee when it comes to consideration of the bill. So there's no perceived conflict there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Chairman, for not bringing that up. Uh, draft minutes, uh, 16th of September, page four. Are we content with the draft minutes? Okay. okay if, we're good, if we're agreed for them to be published on the website. Okay. Yep. Content. Uh, matters arising. Uh, statistics for manufacturing PPE in Northern Ireland. I remind members during last week's meeting, the research agreed to forward the statistics for manufacturing PP in Northern Ireland as information was circulated to members on the 17th of September for information. Members, do we have any comments? Happy to note. Noted. Uh, terms of reference for the Executive Subcommittee on Reform. Inform the members that the Department has sent a copy of the terms of reference for the Executive Subcommittee on Reform at table. Uh, tabled at page four. Any comments? Content. Happy to note. Uh, next item on the agenda is establishment of a fiscal council in terms of reference. Inform member of the department's response to the committee's request regarding establishment of fiscal council is tabled at page seven. Members, have we any comments? Page seven of the table papers. Of the papers. Uh, can we now move on to the oral evidence and public sector reform? And can we welcome um, uh, Bill and Emer and Helen? You, have we got connected to Helen. Helen, can you hear us? We have. Yes. Good. Excellent. Hi, Emer. Hi, Bill. Hello. Good to see you again. Okay, Tim, just want to remind you that the agenda item has been recorded by Hansard. The following papers relate to this agenda item. The clerk's briefing paper on page 13, departmental briefing on page 16, and the Northern Ireland Audit Office report on the Northern Ireland Public Sector Voluntary Exit Scheme 2016, tabled at page 10. Bill, would you like to make some opening comments? Uh, not so much. Uh, Chair, really, just that we provided the paper. Um, we're happy to move quite quickly to take some questions on it. We'd just like to introduce Emer. 
uh, who is the new head of public sector reform division, been in the post from this Monday. Emer is, of course, an experienced member of the senior team in DOF and some of the issues familiarity to her, etc., uh, and she will be responsible for taking many of our issues forward, uh, but she's been in the post from Monday. And we also have in line Helen Toner, who's the head of our uh, business consultancy service, uh, and should we go into the detail of the work of that team and the projects there, Helen will be able to contribute and we can, can help us with that. Uh, and so, with that, Chair, happy to move on to what the committee might do. Okay. Are, are, are we we're take, in, taking evidence then broadly on the public sector? Thank you um, both. I was going to ask some questions about um, OECD implementation, if that's okay, Chair, mm -hmm. if I'm doing it in the correct order. Um, uh, thank you both for, 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 for coming and giving evidence. Just on the um, OECD report, which I've read the executive summary of, I haven't read all 500 pages, I it's just say that up front. Um, that was, just so we're clear on that, that was um, published in July 2016, but in summer, was it May 2018, the department got next board to agree to cease systematic monitoring of delivery against it. That's correct. Um, there have been two years where, on a quarterly basis, uh, the public, <laughs> uh, this directorate, you know, sent out to all of the action owners that we, and indeed there were a considerable number of sub actions as well. We regularly produced reports to the board. By that period in 2018, I came to this director personally on second uh, of. of of October 2017, uh, but the two reports that I personally prepared for the sorry, the two reports that I personally prepared for the next board uh, in relation to this were pretty much exactly the same. Uh, that we felt that the change had substantially uh, been made or embedded in what people were calling business as usual aspects of that, uh, and. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the grid type monitoring, or recommendation by recommendation in the table, felt that type of work had served its purpose, and that it could be moved to, really, I suppose, substantially the delivery, and implementation of the program for government and its outcomes based approach. And just on the, um, on the table. The, we sort of have a, a table of ra, like with RAG ratings um, on the 30 main strategic recommendations, of which I think two, the then executive did not accept. But is that being, I didn't say this in a con, sort of provocative way, but is that being, is there, those two red RAGs, for example, are they being, have they just been left to, to not be implemented? Or, or is there a, an action outstanding to implement them? Or are they the two that were rejected? Mm -hmm. um, they were substantially rejected by right. the, uh, <coughs> the Department for the Economy, who would be responsible for that regulation, felt that they were covered elsewhere and that the action, necessary action, uh, to ensure a quality regulation service had been delivered. And so, uh, in terms of particular actions as recommended in the OECD report, they didn't take those forward. Uh, and as you can see, we highlighted that to the board as we took a decision uh, as, as to whether or not to park those. And the, the overall OECD report, when it comes to both um, NDNA preparations, the uh, preparation of NDNA, and, and then I guess subsequently conversations that have happened, obviously they've been um, stop start because of COVID conversations around a new programme for government, what, have they formed any part of those conversations? Um, I think they have. I must say I found it an interesting exercise uh, going back to the 2018 uh, re report as, 
I prepared to come here. Uh, there are some of those where it is reasonably clear uh, that the absence of a focus on an outcomes-based programme for government uh, in the absence of an executive, uh, while we carried on as a civil service, taking the outcomes approach in the individual, that some aspects of the uh, reforms, I think, were difficult uh, and would even be carried forward into NDNA as recommendations in terms of the three-year budget. Right. We've never managed to have a multi-year, a multi-annual budget despite the desire back then to achieve that. It, 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 it hasn't been achieved, and we hope again as, as, as we look forward on that. But there are some of those things where it is fairly clear that while, if you like, the structures were put in place, that programme for government document that was uh, consulted upon, widely agreed, uh, agreed across the executive ministers at the time, out to consultation and back, but never finally completed or delivered. Some of those, while the structures were put in place, we, we haven't actually taken through to uh, a point where you could say it is finally delivered and in place, and in response to, I suppose, the three-year budget one is one of the best examples in linking that to um, the, linking the three-year budget to the objectives. It is a very specific and similar NDNA commitment, uh, and it's something that we have yet to achieve and in place. We're having the resources directly linked to that uh, is something that we can plan the basis of. Uh, yet it's a, a key element of linking resources to your strategy for the delivery of any public service. One part of the um, Public Sector Reform Directorate is the Economic Advisory and Governance Unit. Mm -hmm. um, does that I think it seems to be quite loud. Um, uh, quite close to the mic. Does that include? I, I presume that includes a sort of a team of trained economists. Yes, um, that would be led by a grade seven economist uh, with two. It varies between DP or an assistant economist that would support them. Mm -hmm. uh, within the wider SPAR, I of course also have the strategic policy division which oversees the economics profession for the civil service, uh, and we place the teams within it. Uh, should they need it, they can, of course, consult with that team uh, and stand and deliver upon it as well. But that, as a team of economists, it also provides within the director a lot of our corporate core ancillary services from general service that are within that team. Know, managing your own budget and coordinating AQs, inputs, coordinating the paper you have today. Mm. Uh, is that the team that is taking forward work on the Fiscal Council, or are they involved in it? Fiscal Council is in the Strategic Policy Division directly our economist unit. When we looked at the Fiscal Council as our NDNA recommendation, following on the <laughs> St Andrews, it was, it's not a new recommendation in NDNA. As you know, um, we, we had a debate in the department about whether it would be my directorate and strategic policy division who would take it forward, or whether it would be the public spending directorate itself. Uh, but we felt the public spending directorate may seem as though uh, they were appointing a council and would be monitoring their own work. So if you like that separation, and the possible links that the Fiscal Council could take towards, um, if you like, it, later when we as an administration may have more devolved tax powers, mm -hmm. that it might also uh, report on budget sustainability issues that would include looking at incomes, revenues and expenditure that would include tax revenues as well. I've one more, but it's quite a broad question, Chair, so I don't mind deferring to others if they want to come in and they can come back. Um, but but my, quite, my quite broad question, thematic question, is the, um, the public sector reform uh, directorate seems to be, public sector reform is obviously an, an enormous 
job of working in Northern Ireland and something that we, I mean, you talked about St Andrews. I think the St Andrews Agreement was signed a year after I left St Andrews University and it'll be 20 years since I went to St Andrews University next year. So that gives a, a sense of how long standing this, a lot of this stuff is. But um, uh, is there a, I suppose my question is what's bringing all this together at a, or is is it being tied together perhaps for the new head of the civil service whenever they are appointed in the coming weeks? If you think of the, the first of all, the commitments in NDNA, the, I suppose, unactioned things from previous documents, um, the outworking of RHI, um, there seem to be quite a few big structural things. Is that overall, you know, would you, would you recognize that description or am I being unfair? And is that the responsibility of, um, ESRD to tie that together? Um, I, I think it goes outside and beyond PSRD. If we look at the challenges and then it, it comes to what do you define as reform? The executive, I think in most documents, people would agree that there are four major transformation programs mm -hmm. underway at the minute. If you look to health, education, some of the stuff in just, justice and housing. Uh, they tend to be cited in documentation as the major ones. There's other smaller <laughs> transformation programs as well. Um, uh, PSRD, if you look at our list of projects of both the iLab and the Business Consultancy Service, you can see where we're working with those departments, uh, taking forward those transfers and trying to help and assist them with the projects we would undertake them to do their work in those. Um, it, I think after that you come to uh, how we, um, across the department in the uh, Department of Finance, we have an Enterprise Shared Services Directorate, and in every major reform program in every country and uh, in the depths of the OECD report and most places you would see an element of reform can include looking closely at the capacity shared services to improve efficient delivery customer. So the, the digitalization work the, and uh, wider work across shared services for the civil service and beyond to the wider public sector that ESS deliver is of course always going to be a major part of that. The OECD report referred to procurement as, as issues in relation to it and we have a procurement directorate. Um, so Reform even in DOF goes beyond one division of my directorate. Uh, I, I believe also we are in, in the middle of a significant reform of pay policy, which falls to strategic policy division. We're moving out of a lockdown where we had a, a lockdown, sorry, it's a, it, we're moving out of a pay freeze uh, and then with a pay cap at the 1% where we now have the capacity in our pay policy to use it, to link it to trying to achieve objectives through agreements with staff um, uh, and groups. And we, when we say that um, uh, above the normally budgeted for aspects of pay policy can be financed through reform or other efficiency deliveries, it is possible for departments and indeed for DOF, for the civil service, to look at some reform initiatives that might help for pay, uh, that might help finance slightly higher pay initiatives and where it can be used to incentivize and help the delivery of reform uh, with, within that. Um, the, the fiscal reform and the opportunities for fiscal reform. I've worked on fiscal reform for a lot of years. I spent a bit of time in health in between. But we looked for a long time at the devolution of corporation tax and what that would achieve for Northern Ireland. I know that you've commented in the air passenger duty elements that we did devolve and take forward. And where and how, even now, that that could be a key part of our aviation sector and how it might be competitive coming through COVID. And then smaller taxes and duties, stamp duty in the range of it. So that directorate is working on substantial reforms. Our European directorate is considerably involved in reform initiatives. Um, our leaving the EU will require much change in the delivery of services. Uh, we are 
in terms of structural funds losses, there is uh, potentially 90 million a year that we won't have, that we will have to look to refinance that from other ways, a new system, some procedure, that aspect of money. So, um, across the Strategic Policy and Reform Directorate in all of our teams, I, you'd linked it to the RHI and the wider response. Sorry that this answer is a little longer than intended, uh, but that response um, will need to it has the most advanced elements of our responses in terms of what others see in relation to it, uh, where the codes, separate issue for the committee and whether the codes are strong enough, but where the codes for ministers, civil servants, and special advisors, that set out our raison d'etre, our well-being, and how we behave, and how decisions might mm. be more transparent, um, will be a significant part of leading that through to then a very specific program of civil service reform. Um, and the elements of the response to the RHI inquiry go then to some governance issues across risk management, across how we appraise and approve expenditure, uh, including as well the record keeping and the other detailed aspects that we will have to respond to in that report. Uh, that will bring it together. Uh, so, th yeah, so, yes, but there's a lot of work. <laughs> there is a huge amount of work doing that, overseen by what I think a new head of the service will have to try to bring alongside the delivery. Sir Patrick was very clear in his report that he didn't see it as a line-by-line -line, uh, implementation of a tick box system against individual reports or systems or our updated DOF guidance that we would then put out there and others would have to comply with in relation to it. It was a more longer term thing to change the culture and values of how people apply those, take decisions, are transparent about it, liaise with the third sector, their customers and stakeholders to deliver to make sure uh, that that focus is there. So, it, in, it includes all of those elements and getting that across the service to all departments, although a lot of that guidance that we're talking about that could drift to that text box is, is DOF guidance. DOF produces from the top floor of Clare House procurement guidance, business case guidance, managing public money and public expenditure guidance. Um, we have the other guidance of the ESS issue in terms of information management and other issues like record keeping and the detail of that as well. So we have responsibilities for a lot of guidance. The bringing that together and the application of that guidance in every project the civil service undertakes is really when the full response to RHI will have been delivered. Thanks. Pat? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, thanks very much, Mr. Polly. Uh, and was you, Miss Morelli, every success to you and you Thank both? Thank you. <laughs> there I hope you can hear me all right. Um, the, 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 this is a, a key part of where we are in this committee and trying to look at the reform that we're trying to go to. Uh, on COVID, uh, how has COVID played in? I know it's, it's there, but no one has the crystal ball to know where it will be going forward. And what I'm trying to get to, a lot of money has been spent to allow working from home. Uh, this is an opportunity probably to look at our state and the assets. And as have you worked or has work been completed and how much physical office space uh, will be needed uh, for the working environment going forward? Um, COVID has played a, a huge element of that. Not directly with me, but I know something of the reform of property management work is something that I suppose the department has been taking forward in different ways over 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 uh, quite a number of years, accumulating really in the agile project, um, uh, which is and had been planned to take forward indeed. It was to be rolled out in this division in Clare House where we have a lot of people work for clients and others and so uh, that type of working suits us, and we can be a first type 
of, of pilot or, uh, but the COVID in terms of re reform initiatives like digitalization and working from home, the ability to uh, working from home and working from other locations, whether it's a core hub that's not in the city centre, not in Belfast and around Northern Ireland, that uh, has been a huge part of that. The amount of data that we have, how that can be done, and done quite quickly and put in a place and done effectively, is uh, there to be captured, and we're yeah. attempting to capture it across it. Within the division, I think that'll be a key, a key thing to look at. Um, you know, COVID has led things to be delivered in a different way, delivered at pace, delivered hopefully for the benefit of citizens and departments working very closely together on that. And part of our role in PSRD would be through our innovation labs, where we try to bring the stakeholders who have been involved in those issues in, learn the lessons quickly, get them disseminated, get that good practice out there. You know, a key role, I think, for PSRD. The foundations of reform are there. They're there in New Decade, New Approach. They're there in the RHI Inquiry. It's now how do we give the service the capacity, the ability to respond and build on those foundations. And I think a key issue for PSRD, we will not be able to cover every single element of reform, I, I hope, but we will be able to identify where there's gaps, where we need to make change, where we can help our colleagues, where cross-departmental working can work better. What works elsewhere? What are the methodologies and tools we can use? And the lab has recently started a, a project to look at uh, the well-being of staff uh, in this COVID situation. And um, if people are working from home, not out and about, not engaging with their colleagues, having that su the support structures that that can give to people as well, to see what learning is, is coming from that. And the lab is the tools to. <coughs> Just uh, on the lab itself, just that you made reference to it there, I was wondering just how, I mean, how efficient do you think that that has worked and how many meetings has it had? Not sure about meetings. Um, the iLab has grown right. from it was first started and in fact some of the people there have been promoted a little bit as well. We now have about 10 people in the lab, depending on full-time equivalents or what way you might come to do it. Um, but broadly, it provides three services, the demand for which um, is way beyond um, what the lab can provide in, in, in terms of the numbers of potential clients or people who come with projects for the lab. So where the first bit of what they do is to try uh, to discuss with the client, to try and agree and look and see is this a project that the lab can help most with and, and to do across. Not to cut across you, but has there been any recommendations? Have you found recommendations implemented? Not yet, or? Numerous ones across right. them from, good. Uh, from, you know, some quite simple projects. We have a, you know, we we have a team within the lab who look at the behavioural aspects of how public services are impacting on people. Some of that work has ranged from just looking at the letters we send out to people, to even try to recover a simple thing like rates debt, and how you write that letter and how it lands with a customer how they understand what you have to do. If you cite it in a whole lot of rating regulations that require you to pay rates, you get very little. The response is a lot different than if you give people the information they need to help you recover and do that. So it is looking how people, how, how a letter when it comes from the public sector lands with you when you read it and what you have to do and respond to it. The lab has looked at that and the response rates to um, initiatives like that have been really significant. We've looked as well at rates at the customer journeys. Um, of someone buying a new house, how do they first engage with rates? A lot of people think the first place they should go would be a district council website because they think rates pays district council. So there's different impressions and things that even if you look at the journey that the customer has from their end, that then the revision of advice and those people, they're actually even only trying to register and pay their rates um, and how the information we share can, can do that. So there, there's been those aspects through to like major projects in what we would call the system dynamic modelling of where 
you would have unintended consequences from some actions. But if you take a particular action in health to try to uh, encourage uptake of vaccine or to uptake, of whatever, some people uh, respond differently, and then it has wider responses in the rest of the health service that you may or may not be able to cope with. And the lab is involved in a, in a range of projects across those features. And then we have a, a design element of the lab that would help people redesign their service to take account of those customer views and leave recommendations with them across the different departments and areas from the selection. And show efficiencies, I'm sure that's the, the end There's goal of all of that. Sure, well, can I all right to just a couple more of it is, but they, they, they are linked, what I'm trying to do. And I mean, in my last time in Belfast, we wouldn't have survived without that influx of civil servants that mm -hmm. came into the Belfast city centre. So I'm now talking about the decentralisation. Uh, there's, an up, there's an update on the success of it, uh, as you see, to Bali, uh, Bali Kelly. And I was wondering, where, where do you sit with, with all of that decentralisation? And is there work ongoing uh, within your lab or within your own department in order to push that out? We haven't really been involved in that. Right. Wider reform of property managed link. Uh, the Bally Kelly element for it was pretty much led by uh, dear colleagues yeah. themselves, and they took up that. But there's no, there's no. I mean, uh, surely there has to be a financial uh, impact there's in all of that. I mean, that's going to be part of the savings and on the reform. <coughs> I mean, the point, Mr. Polly, with mm -hmm. as as the togetherness of it all, as working, trying to get it all sort of linked up, realising the numbers of different departments and where you are with this reform and trying to see how much of it is joined up as best as possible. Looking forward to the new appointment, mind you, uh, for <laughs> after today to see where we go on this. Um, I think we're all interested in that. Yeah. Um, I I think that element of de it, it's not directly in the public sector, but yeah. it, it is clearly a, a key part of how people behave in reform at work. It will also be a part, and I don't want to jump into other things or other. Um, one of the things that we're looking at in our arm's length body review is where these things are as well, and the locations of them, and whether efficient even made as well, that where different bodies come into that. But the location of civil servants has, in all of my time uh, as a civil servant, been a key feature. I looked at moving jobs from Belfast to Derry in 1986, uh, where the options were closing Rathgale, and whether or not we would put civil servants in Castle Court when it was being built in the, in the civil service. And it was, as you say, a key part of the uh, Victoria Square development, what Churchill House changed. In, in, in relation to that, um, but we we do not, to my knowledge, have a formal policy of decentralisation out of Stormont or Belfast at this minute in time. We we have been looking more within the UF at the potential for agile working, about the efficiencies we can have in our buildings where we move out of buildings like this one with individual rooms and services to have rooms that look more like Clare House. Um, where we're open plan and where people can engage with each other and work together and uh, gather those efficiencies and those ways of working rather than individual offices with leather trying chairs. Trying to retain the skills, that's the, you know, yeah. just trying to retain the skills that you have uh -huh. in the civil service and look at it. Absolutely. Natural um, waste. And people, people are very keen to look at uh, these uh, centres or hubs that might be like they've worked very well around the M25. We haven't quite got the traffic group in, out of London in, in, in terms of that, but there is certainly some scope that there could be hubs put in place uh, that would help a lot of the environmental aspects of traffic and other congestion that would be popular with staff and others to save them an hour every an hour a day in journey times. To and yet they could have aspects of engagement and do. And it's not working at home. It's working in an office environment that they can come hot desk, log into the desk that they have there, and there are types of work that that suits really well. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. So, Jim. 
Yeah. Just um, a short questions and short answers. Uh, so, as I understand exactly Amer's position, your new role is what's your new title? Head of Public Sector Reform Division. Uh, so, who now is head of supply? There's, there's been appointments to. Sorry? There's been two appointments to head of supply. Can you just tell us who those are? Sorry, I, I can't hear you, Amer. Oh, sorry. Can you cut up the push um, the mic? That's uh, Patrick Neeson and Jonathan McAdams. Right. Okay. Sorry, just a convenient. There are two heads of public. There's been an additional post at, at senior civil service led, creating in the public spending directorate to reflect the demand and the needs that were on it, where Emer, if you like, has been replaced by two men. Um, uh, not that that was a criteria in relation to it, but uh, that. Uh, those two people have taken up appointments in the last two weeks following a selection board. Uh, so who's in charge of it? Or the public um, sector? Jo Joanne McBurney is the director at grade three level of the public spending directorate and the supply team now would have two grade fives who um, each will be responsible for a portfolio as I understand it of the departments. Uh, they will split the departments across right. two supply units. And they will. Uh, they, there are some central services that we, uh, you know, they can lead so, into. So, who previously held Amer's current post? Um, the last Helen, who is with us, was temporarily promoted to that project for about a year. When, after uh, we had a lady called. Uh, I think Ms. Kelly Clark left the department in December 18. Uh, the post wasn't filled on a substantive basis. Uh, it, it, there was a temporary promotion to that post that okay. lasted some 16, 18 months. So are we now in a settled position? I hope so. Right. Are you telling okay. me it took two men to replace Hemer? Thank you. Yeah. Does that tell you something? Um, I was thinking of but I had to have the parties. It shows you how you're up, up, Steady, steady. Calm down, calm oh, down, okay. calm down. Okay. This is important work. <laughs> just I bring when you. we say a steady okay, position, okay. Uh, just, just to be clear, uh, I supposed we used part of the money for the Grade 5 post in the Public Sector Reform Division to pay for the Grade 5, who is currently uh, the RHI sponsor branch and Work, working on the department's response uh, to the RHI inquiry, who was here with me, David Hughes, the last time mm -hmm. uh, that, that we were here. So we used what we had, given the demands that were there across that. Uh, we're moving, hopefully, towards a settled position. Um, I do hope that the RHI post will, at some stage, as we respond to that report, in the next three, six, nine months, that that post can. That yeah, well, just to stay with RHI for a moment, mm -hmm. um, that's about reforms that might flow from RHI. Um, Without prying into the disciplinary side of things, is that also under the wing of your department, <coughs> of your section? Yes, I, I lead on the response to the RHI. Inquiry report and coordinate that across. And that includes the disciplinary teams. processes? Uh, the disciplinary element of it, I don't lead on it, is done with Nick's HR and the personnel. So that's outside, yes. That. that would be outside of me. The other elements of the response, <coughs> acting as secretary to the executive subcommittee and producing, coordinating and pulling together. Okay, the I, was only at, I was only asking about the, the disciplinary side. So that's not your. That's not me or HR. Okay. Could, I, could I return to one of the issues that Pat Catney raised about um, diversifying uh, Bally Kelly, etc.? I was really quite taken aback to hear you say that those are individual departmental decisions. Surely, if we're into the business of reform at any, at any level, there has to be a central thread through all of that. 
yet when it comes to an issue as pivotal as that, you're telling us no departments do their own thing? Um, there are central threads uh, to everything within that. Uh, the Bally Kelly decisions, when they were taken some years ago, it's my understanding that they were driven really and within would the that department. still be the position today? Um, DOF is responsible for the public sector estate and the management of the public sector estate, so we would have a role within that. Would it be any different role than what you had with Bally Kelly? Uh, I don't think so. So therefore, the department is free to make the sort of Bally Kelly decision that agriculture made even today in 2020. There's no central also, uh, also coordination. There, there is central coordination in terms of property management, lease management, issues there that departments would have delegations and there would be financial delegations in terms of business cases and expenditure that would have to flow through DOF in the normal way, in the normal type of approval rules that we can have. Right. I didn't think the answer was very clear on what impact home working is likely to have on upcoming reform. Are you still sucking it and seeing, or is there is there a, a view being taken about that? We we haven't collected all the data. Uh, of the extent to which we have home working now, or, or the aspects of that. Um, people are are currently working at home. You've seen the wider guidance in, in terms of to do it for a very different reason than purely the reform aspects of it. But uh, I suppose what I'm saying is that there is a huge amount of data uh, that we can collect. Where previously, in terms of the agile working, we had uh, a pilot exercise that was on two floors of Goodwood House. Uh, we now have that home working pretty much across the service, across all departments, and where very large numbers of people are working from home. What's the biggest problem with it? Uh, there, there are aspects coming out, as I see, from other reports as a director in the department, rather than us necessarily producing in this particular division, um, uh, that uh, th there, there's harder work to keep in touch with people, to share, to in make sure that you have the level of engagement you need, that everybody remains up to date with different stages. And, and there are aspects of it in terms of well-being of staff and other things, um, and even in, in other issues as well, we're looking at absence rates uh, and other things. But whether so is absentee are absent rates a bigger or smaller problem with home working? Absence has fallen. Yeah. Is there any issue with slacking? Um, I haven't seen anybody identify or quantify any issues of slacking or whatever. But when you have data, you look at the data to see what it means. Uh, and if there are issues around uh, absence rate change, that uh, a reduction in absence rates was also one of the benefits that happened from agile working before COVID or, 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 or any really, as, as you have more flexible approaches for staff, they can do whatever message they need to do at a time and work. Jim, can I come in there a second? Eight. How are, you, how are you going about measuring output from uh, remote working? Um, I personally am not measuring that across the civil service or to... Well, somebody must measure. And, and that, the measuring the outputs of our teams are doing it. We, we know the quantum of work that staff have in terms of what we're taking forward in terms of projects and issues that come to do it. Uh, and. Um, you know, there's different types of policy work that are very different to those who would have a uh, number of benefit claims processed or, 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 or those aspects of work, obviously. So there is data have, gathering going on. You, you have very particular data that we know, we know how many, indeed, you know, 
COVID has brought dramatic increases, for example, in universal credit claims and other. Is somebody like centrally that. coordinating that? Um, whether centrally, um, not that I, my understand. Departments are looking at their business areas and monitoring the different work and the effectiveness of, and the impact of COVID on their home areas. How and when that might be brought together when we would emerge and the different lessons learned of that project is, is something uh, that I'm not aware of a central COVID team responding it. The, the people who, if you like, would be central, there are central teams looking at the COVID recovery plan, the COVID responses and things like that, rather than necessarily at this point in time looking to see uh, we know there's more benefit claimants because there's more unemployment. Or in, Something in, the iLab could be usefully doing at the moment? Um, the iLab has a programme of work <laughs> that is quite a full uh, programme of work. I wouldn't think just collecting data would be, I, I, would, I would place that more in NISRA colleagues, that the collection of statisticians and the collection of individual data in NISRA, as you would know, uh, have statistician teams in every department uh, and you, you know the, the, such impacts could you let us know if NISR are gathering this data because this is potentially a very important shift in sort of policy and if we think there's benefits to be made from remote working or home working um, and we've just had coming up to about six months worth of opportunity to analyze it um, could you just let us know how NISR are getting on and whether they've been tasked to do that it would seem a bit remiss if they hadn't. No, um, people are, were possible, trying to learn the lessons of the COVID experiences that we're having uh, and coming to do it. I mentioned the iLab particular piece of work that has come our way to be asked to do it is to look at the well-being of people in those situations. And so we'll collect data and surveys from staff and other material that we understand of that we will produce and come to it. There are other impacts as well <coughs> on absence on <laughs> and for as as one example and that data is being collected and monitored and looked. How it might all at some point be brought together to look at the COVID experience uh, and what we can learn from it isn't there. <coughs> but certainly the property management people are looking and doing work in terms of um, uh, what was once a pilot in a couple of floors of one building in the centre of Belfast has very quickly had to become uh, a way of working across the whole service. Okay, thanks. Jimmy, finish? Uh, Gemma? Thanks for coming. I think most of my points have been covered. Just to clarify, um, Bill, you've made a couple of important points about the wellbeing of staff and then in your written um, evidence you said that there's research going to be carried out among staff about their experience of working during lockdown. Is that linked? Is it? Are they just going to be asked about their well-being? I think we will go to look at the wider experiences okay. and how that might be linked okay. to their well-being, the type of behaviour, the type and nature of the work that they were doing, how that changed, the different experiences of interacting with each other. Um, so much there on the uh, how we work with the technology involved uh, and, and how we pull that out to others and how much of that needs retained. Uh, we've emphasized to staff at the minute it may change. You know, working from home is encouraged at this minute of time and staff all staff are strongly encouraged to do so. There is an element of that says we're where it remains effective to do to do so. Yeah. Staff can, across our teams, Clare House is open. Uh, the other place where I have a team, Nine Lanyon in the city centre, that building's also open. So staff can go in there. They can use the facilities that they need there for short. Uh, and because the vast majority of people aren't there, social distancing, all those requirements can be comfortably observed at, at this moment. But the extent to which the need and the help to do that and 
whether they're going in there to socialise and engage and to meet with people about policy issues and discuss on issues, or whether it's the simple need um, to have an A3 printer or to have dual screens to what helps them? What is it that's helping them uh, to work effectively in those days can be important aspects. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, that's yeah, Thanks. Uh, Sean? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thanks for coming in. It's just in terms of the review of arms length bodies. Could you give an update on time frame and intended <coughs> outcomes? Um, <coughs> The review of arms length bodies is underway. It's, um, I suppose it's unclear as to whether it's actually in the public sector reform division. Um, we have an individual who does. Uh, I oversee the work with our permanent secretary so, uh, of that, but it hasn't uh, actually formally joined the structure with an individual who's doing that work for us. John, can I just come in there? Just a one wee second there. If Arms length bodies, are, if they're not seen as part of the public sector, uh, it's. We, could you, exp could you well, expand on that? I suppose what I'm saying is we really have put that review in a very flat structure uh, to do it within uh, a short and focused period of time that we would do the first parts of, the, of that review and where it doesn't, if you like, every paper or every aspect doesn't have to go between each grade of a civil service to get to the point to do it. We have someone who is working in that who reports directly to myself and Sue Gray. It hasn't gone through any of the management team between the public sector reform division. That person... John, apologies for that. I was just a bit confused yeah. there. In relation to that, um, we now have received the responses from departments in respect of about 116 of the arm's length bodies. Um, there's currently a desktop exercise ongoing to analyse and look at those data uh, uh, to reach a sort of first conclusions in terms of what might be presented to our minister and uh, subsequently to his executive colleagues on that arm's length. We hope that that paper will go through that during October. Uh, in, in relation to that, where um, the type of questions would, that are being asked is really whether uh, there is a need for the service in question to be delivered uh, at arm's length from a department, and hence the direction of the minister. We've looked at uh, when it was last subjected to the formal reviews that are required of our arm's length bodies. We've looked at its board structures. We've looked at um, uh, different approaches to public appointments and different salaries of point public appointees in relation to that. And there will be a range of questions that come out of that about different arm's length bodies and, and the possible future of those bodies. Uh, it's immediately evident when you look at them that some are very small and actually then some are very large, um, the help, ranging from Health Trust to the Education Authority to invest NI, delivering huge elements of, a, yeah. of our public service. We have about £11 billion worth of expenditure that flow through arm's length bodies in, in relation to it. So uh, the timetable is broadly that during October we hope that the Minister will take some of those first findings to executive colleagues. Uh, uh, that will determine then which of those arm's length bodies we would look more closely at in terms of what their future might be in line with what the new decade, new approach document asked us to look at both really the effective efficiency of those bodies as well as the governance aspects of it. Okay. Just, just one. Yes, uh, you said there was 116 arm lengths, and obviously you have outlined a number of very important ones with huge responsibilities. Would it be the view to significantly reduce that number? The new decade, new approach asked us to look at that possibility of the number of those that can be reduced, whether there can be efficiencies that don't quite go to the stage of reducing 
<laughs> the, the number of arm's length body. But, uh, I mean, yes, reduction is part of what was tasked, a new decade, new approach, and is part of the terms of reference for that review. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. Nice. Uh, Fadja Rove, uh, Shahan Yu, you're very welcome here this evening. I was called Gary, just fast name it. Congratulations, Eamon. I don't know how congratulations is an order given the task that it's <laughs> have in hand now. Uh, or commiserations, quite possibly. Um, and, um, but I, I, I just want to go back again over sort of territory we've covered. In fact, um, like Mr Alistair, I was shocked uh, whenever you uh, had actually said that it wasn't part of your remit. Uh, in terms of decentralisation, uh, and I'd have thought that uh, when one was looking at um, uh, reform, uh, that decentralisation would have been a central bank there, in terms of its evaluation and whether or not one was uh, actually um, delivering any uh, project in that respect. You know, in terms of relocation. Uh, but you, you at least you think that one would have been looking at the pros and cons of it one way or the other. And uh, given the experience that we have had now with COVID, uh, an experience where effectively we have had, in a way, um, enforced decentralisation uh, and that many people are working from home. Uh, and in particular, that when it does come to the likes of uh, the locations, i.e. Belfast and Derry, that uh, once again the question arises that uh, if we consider um, county towns like Oma or Inneskillen, places of that nature, that there would be benefits there. Uh, and this is the case that uh, in order to maybe even consider that, that it is only but a political decision, i.e. in terms of a, a minister taking that decision that should be considered by a particular department. Uh, or that is it not a very much an integral part of uh, looking at uh, reform in terms of the delivery of service and everything else? I think the location of those jobs will, following COVID, and when we talked about the possibility of hubs uh, that would be there, that wouldn't, uh, where staff that could work for any department could go to a building that was, if you like, an NICS building or a public sector building, they could log in and work from there and they would have access to whether it was the double screens or the A3 printers or whatever it might be in, in relation to that and the material and the support services they need. And the location of those hubs, hubs could well include uh, those people uh, who live beyond even the greater Belfast Parade. It's not simply, I, I, I know I mentioned the M25, which suggests around a single city type approach. And, and it, it, it can certainly be on that to where our people are traveling to work from. And we do know that we have people who drive um, uh, from Coleraine, uh, I was going to say every day, different, different days. There can be flexible working patterns now that happen in relation to it. And from the other towns, whether it be Oma, Dungannon, Yuri, uh, in relation to it, that pe we, we do have staff travelling every day from those towns to either Belfast or Stormont predominantly uh, to work. And certainly the location of some hubs um, that could offer the ability of staff uh, working for any department, no matter where its headquarters was or how big a building that was in the future. Um, to work for that department and to have a workstation that made the effectiveness of that working pretty much the same, irrespective of that. Well, yeah. just in addition to that, uh, with the likes of the business consultancy service, uh, that in them doing their appreciation or recommendations again too, uh, would it be uh, the case that uh, they once again will be looking at uh, the likes of Belfast and the impact that it has when a particular uh, department and uh, staff are located in the city, and how it impacts on other businesses and that there, uh, as opposed to uh, taking into consideration uh, the same need for uh, uh, incentive to business uh, in the more rural areas? Um, th that would be an aspect of choosing where the hub 
if we move to that, and that's an option that people are looking at that, and where those hubs might be located in terms of the business consultancy service isn't working on that at the minute, but where we working in that type thing, that would be a feature of preparing any business case for hubs. Which brings me back to the, my initial statement, uh, and now more as a question. Is this entirely a political decision, or uh, would it be a recommendation coming from this type of consultancy? Um, it, in the first place, this would be a... Uh, <laughs> a, a business decision about the ability for the department to take about the location of its service and which buildings it have. Would that be something that any one department consult its minister on? Um, yes, I would imagine that that would be the case. And would the most significant of those types of decisions come to DOF in terms of the wider reform and property management of the civil service of a whole? Ultimately, DOF would have a, a decision in that. Um, um, but um, there, there are some decisions that we as officials can take around case number of buildings, whether with agile working, how much flexibility with home working or other parts can we have in line with good practice, and then there are others that become fundamental and where there may be a political aspect where politicians such as yourselves would begin uh, to take an interest. Uh, and. You know where where it would start to have an impact on issues such as the regionally bound growth objective that the executive has set itself. Um, then you know significant moves or changes that would affect that would need that sort of level of thought. Yeah, thanks very much, indeed, Melissa. And yeah, thanks very much. I just got a few questions. I'm sorry I didn't come in any earlier, but I just wanted to um, get a, an outline and view of it. Uh, just a couple of specifics. Um, you know we've been looking at the voluntary exit scheme, and one of the things that we as a committee are going to take is a very close view, and in fact, did it, it ever achieve any of the savings and efficiencies that we're supposed to have achieved? Um, and one of the things in the Northern Ireland Audit Office was there was uh, the day of the Department of Finance was going to say each year it will monitor and report the level of net savings generated against overall pay bill expenditure other staff and interest costs. And bearing in mind I was talking earlier about what's the output and monitoring and looking at information. Can you tell me, um, because I don't think I've seen any of those reports, um, could you tell me uh, where those reports are and when are we going to see them? Um, I had thought that we had sent most of the evaluation reports to the committee. We've listed a number of pieces of correspondence uh, right. in in the document in in relation to that. Uh, in relation to we and this is specifically against sort of pay bill expenditure, staff, and other costs. Uh, is certainly the pay bill expenditure that we would have, and we would certainly have the data on. Uh, we know how much the exits cost mm -hmm. uh, for e for each of the schemes. We know how much uh, the pay bill savings would have done, and um, we have certainly done the calculation of um, where some of those exits would have been replaced, so that you would have a net pay bill saving. If you and so, the Department of Finance is producing an annual report on that, are they? We have produced an evaluation report for each of the three main years that the Public Sector Transformation Scheme, as it was called, the Voluntary Exit Scheme, uh -huh. uh, operated uh, in, in, in relation to that. So, Have we done any reports since on sort of the implications and what's happened and whether there has been sort of pinch points and there's been other, other issues to do with that? I think... Because bear um, in mind that's going to be quite important when we're looking at, you know, substantial public sector reform is going to deal significantly with sort of uh, shifts in personnel and re-evaluation yeah. and movements of personnel and various other issues? The, the voluntary exit schemes, I mean, the principal ask of us was to reduce paper. 
uh, savings in relation to that. And the money was uh, provided in that way. Uh, when I say the money was provided, it was access to borrowing. So we borrowed the money under the reinvest and reform initiative that would have financed the exit schemes. And that was on the basis that the expectation was that the pay bill savings would enable the borrowing to be paid off and to secure the wider savings. And partly that was being driven. It was the, the vast, the, the overriding priority was to achieve pay bill savings uh, without damaging the operation of the service, but that the pay bill savings were the key feature. Uh, within that, and that has substantially uh, been ach been achieved uh, in, in, in relation to almost all of the schemes have achieved that separately. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the civil service was one scheme of a number mm -hmm. of, of schemes uh, within it, where uh, in, in totally across the four years, you know, we'd. 34 different entities who had them, of which the civil service is one, in relation to most of the others would have been arm's length bodies and other features of that. Um, and the level of savings differed across those, as arm's length bodies typically um, were front line yeah. op operation and services. But we, are, we, we would have data, and my understanding is that we have provided all of the evaluation reports that are available. We are still finalising one of them for 2017-18. Uh, uh, 2017-18. The schemes that operated during 2017-18 were, if you like, the benefits of those schemes and the pay bill savings, so that the evaluation carried out after that. And we are currently pulling together the evaluation of the schemes for the three years into a single evaluation report. Right. Okay. Or the exit scheme as a whole. Um, but at the top level, has the scheme achieved significant pay bill savings? And there are the pay bill, those pay bill savings are typically under 18 months uh, in, in terms of at the cost of the exit, in terms of how much, uh, how long does it take you to achieve? the pay bill savings, and that's even taken into account uh, uh, where some posts <coughs> would have been replaced or, or filled where it was a critical post. Okay, thanks. Um, Imer, a couple of questions for you. And first of all, congratulations. Uh, welcome to the... Um, uh, one of the biggest issues that came out, for, of course, from the RHI report was, in fact, that um, in many respects, the Northern Ireland Civil Service at the upper levels isn't fit for purpose, or else RHI wouldn't have happened. And indeed, we're seeing examples across all areas of sectors where things have gone very badly wrong, where the normal checks and balances controls have haven't been. So, uh, just so we get it, because I think your role is going to be fundamental in this. Okay. So, if you were going to give me your mission statement, because you've already talked about, and I think your language you used was linking resources to strategy. So there must be a strategy. So. What's your mission statement for the PSRD? PSRD, I really think we are there to support institutional and cultural change that's needed. I think there's strategies across the system that can be implemented and used. The people strategy where capability and capacity is a key theme needs to be implemented and brought through. I think people need to stop avoiding taking hard decisions and be given the tools to make those hard decisions. And I think in PSRD we can look to best practice elsewhere and support and help that. I think we can look where there's gaps and address those gaps. And I think there are gaps in the system that we just need to be upfront about and say we need to we need to do something about this. I think fundamentally we need to find a structure that allows departments and officials to talk to each other in an open and transparent way and where lessons can be learned on one side, share them share them quickly. Where bad things happen, share those too. Let's all learn together. And if we can't do it ourselves, get external advice, get external people in that can help us. And I think through our own internal consultancy, you know, knowing what we can do ourselves and then looking to the outside through external consultancy, you know, get that information in. To the innovation labs, 
The civil service needs to reach out wider. We need stakeholders to come with us. We can't just be the decision makers on our own. And I think the Innovation Lab allows that freedom of thought and innovation to actually take place and happen. And I think we can learn a lot from that. I think COVID is also an excellent example of people standing up, taking decisions, making things happen at pace, but all in an accountable way to the taxpayer. And I think ultimately, PSRD needs to be a hub that helps support that. I don't think we can be responsible for implementing all the reforms. I don't think we'd have the, have the capacity to do that ourselves. But we need to look to help as much as we can and put those See, methodologies in place. That's an interesting point. You say you don't have the capacity to institute all the reforms. No, they're service-wide. Yeah. You know. So who's in charge? Who's going to deliver this? Well, I think the departments, the accounting officers of departments in health, education, justice, where the big reforms will happen. DOF, we are responsible for our own reforms. But I think we need to understand where the reforms are happening, why they're happening, are they happening for the right reason, and are they needed, which is another key issue. You know, we're not doing reform for the sake of reform. And I think in PSRD, we can keep that overview, we can keep that site, but we can also help, help departments deliver those reforms and understand why they're doing them. Do you feel you've got buy-in from the other departments? Absolutely, yes. I think the new decade, new approach gives us the foundation. Our HI gives us the foundation. We have to do things now as a civil service, and it's written for us. So there's very little wriggle room there, in my view, um, and we're all in it together, really, to go forward. Okay. Uh, the other issue, I think there was a comment that came up about sort of uh, Northern Ireland civil service uh, doing uh, sort of internally the NI and Northern Ireland Civil Service is uh, responding to the challenges of RHI. One of the questions I think many of us would ask is, is the Northern Ireland Civil Service the right people to be the people who are looking at the challenges that are being caused by RHI? Because a lot of the problems from RHI were caused, if we look at the report, was caused by the Northern Ireland Civil Service. So how do we ensure that when we're looking at the necessary form that we have, that it's been done appropriately by the right people. Because if you're only marking your own homework, how do we get to the point where we're actually going to get delivery of the cultural change? Because you know, that, let's get to let's get to the core of it. Unless the culture changes, nothing's going to change, and that has to come from the top. And that's why I specifically asked the question: Is who's in charge? Now you can't have eight people in charge. The same way you can't have two civil servants being in charge of one particular department, no matter how much it's done. And one of the reasons I asked the question specifically about sort of the mission statement is for anything that's substantial, if you can't explain it in one sentence, I think there's real concern about the direction of travel we're on. And I know you, you tried to, and I dropped you in it, but you are su supposedly in the key central role within the Northern Ireland Civil Service implementing the change that they're desperately needed from, from RHI. And you need to be able to say, I have the back of the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service. They are accountable and responsible for the delivery of this cultural change. I didn't hear that. Um, I don't think that would lie solely with Emer. I think our department Correct. has a key role in that, and so we will have both the head of the department and the head of civil service. RHI, one of the recommendations even, there's a very specific role given as to whether we as a civil service and how well we do at implementing its recommendations by the NIAO, and Kieran Donnelly has indicated that he's comfortable with and will undertake that role and put systems and processes in place to do it. Um, and I think you know, to the extent that NDNA was written in response, or it wasn't in response to the RHI, but in the knowledge of the evidence that had been given to the RHI inquiry, uh, and the words about accountability and transparency of the executive and those sections of NDNA certainly uh, require a confidence to be rebuilt in our institutions and how decisions are taken. And there's a lot of that that will fall to, um, you know, there was 10 of the RHI recommendations that relate to Mr. Spads and civil codes aspects of it. But we're doing that later on this no, afternoon. I, I understand that, and I've seen it, and we've debated that those aspects before and whether it might be. And actually, I had a lot of 
convergence in terms of what the issues are. It's how they're addressed. It, 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 it is a slightly different. But those aspects are there in terms, of, in terms of how decisions are taken. What changes can be made to transparency and accountability? And the other, there's 44 recommendations in total. One is for the Assembly. Uh, uh, one is for the NIAO to have their role. But the rest will be across us making sure uh, that the applications of systems and process, uh, that the guidance and facilities exist to do that, and then comes that wider and bigger challenge of the culture of everyone engaged in it, uh, changes mm. to value it. I mean, from our and to make com it from our committee's perspective, because we have looked at the voluntary exit scheme, and I think we have got quite a few questions that still need to be resolved and answered in that. But public sector reform is going to be key to making Northern Ireland work and work effectively. But it has to be a cultural shift because we can't play around at the edges. As quite frankly, this is not about getting a computer and an A3 printer working. This is about the cultural shift and the mindset shift that means that we're actually delivering. Now, one of the problems I think that many of us in this assembly have seen since we've come back only in a short period of time we haven't seen much indication of a real mindset shift in the flow of information and openness and transparency. So key point if this is going to work, particularly taking the throughput from the new decade, new approach, is that this cultural shift has to come absolutely from the top. But it can't be a question of some departments do it this way and some departments do it that way. There has to be a fully and proper cross-cutting approach to do this and how we manage to do this, because it is about shifting the culture and the cultural values. And I think that's one of the things we as a committee, because bearing in mind I think it will be Connor's, it will come under Connor's Ballywick, and I understand that Connor has been given the responsibility within the executive to head up the RHI Responses Subcommittee. It will be our remit to look closely at this public sector reform and where it lies and keep a very careful idea as it develops and it grows. So as part of that, I would quite like, uh, Emer, if you could do a bit of homework and produce a mission statement that's a sentence long about what you're trying to deliver. I'd also like to have, for the committee, I'd like to have an updated wire, wiring diagram because I wasn't aware of the changes that were happening in, throughout, the, throughout the department. Uh, and it just gives us an oversight in what's going on, who's doing what, where and when, so we're available to do that. We have asked, I think, for the terms of reference for um, what's going on with the RHI piece and the rest of it, and that's part of our table purpose as well. But, Emer, we will want to keep a close eye on how public sector reform is developing. We'll want to keep a careful eye on particular some of the recommendations that are coming out and the recommendations that are, are, are flowing through it, because we have a remarkably short period of time to try and de deliver sort of the changes changes that we need. Sir Pat, sorry, you want to come in? Just and then Matthew, on, just on, on, for a on what you were saying there, Chair, as well. And I mean, there's a key decision being made here today within the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and that decision will show the path of travel, whether the intent is there because of that appointment. So we need to see who gets that role and where they sit in that change that we need. Yeah. Right. So that's the key part. And I would say that if that decision, the right decision, comes out for, uh, today from here, then everything else from that decision should start to fall into place because it needs leadership from the very top in order to do the changes that we all know are needed. Thank you. Matthew, you said a little one. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of um, brief questions. The OECD report, um, which I'm going to bring up again, um, specifically mentions. Sorry. Um, the OECD report says Northern Ireland's public sector workforce shows signs of low morale and of lacking confidence in its leadership. And that was written before um, uh, 
before RHI, as in before RHI was, was known about, mm -hmm. and also before any of the other tumult of the last few years, the collapse of the institutions, the banks, all the rest of it. Because we're, we're relatively pressed for time, it's been a really useful discursive session, but would you say this is a long, low morale and lack of confidence in leadership is a long-term structural challenge for the Northern Ireland Civil Service, or is it recent, as in recent to 2016 in the few years before, or long-term? Um, some of the views in that are very personal, yeah. you know, to, to different people. I think as an organisation, some brilliant work in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. I think there is an awful lot of things that have been achieved. Uh, I think the RHI is an up to all of us who are civil servants. We have looked and, um, you know, the evidence presented to that inquiry around that scheme in many cases wasn't pretty and shows the need for change and uh, for many people it is a reflection that you can lose a little bit of confidence in that in relation to it. I think it does relate to our leadership, it relates to our politics and our whole confidence of, that we would have in our administration uh, to come and do it. And I think it, it, it's not the sole cause of that, but I think as we've moved in and out of devolved structures, that that has stopped us sometimes. I, I, the, the point I'm making with not assigning blame to anyone or why devolved structures collapsed or, didn't or sh if they should or shouldn't have, but we see a great, greater confidence in our Sc colleagues from Scotland, from Wales at times, that their administrations have grown in confidence that they can deliver these services, all of these services for their devolved area uh, in a way that we've had a little bit of a stop start and haven't gained that experience um, in continuing that. Even for things like tax devolution, we're, it's an area where I feel we're behind our colleagues as we talk about it. We've devolved direct long haul air passenger duty uh, where other colleagues in our administrations have moved on to have a range of taxes and a substantial income from income tax and to be setting their own taxes. Uh, raising, you know, it's, it's just one example of confidence of the administrations themselves and, and where that can come from within that. Okay. Um, sir, Bill, Emer, and Alan. <laughs> Thank you very much. If you could have, I'll give you a couple of days to think about that. Yeah. Oh, it's always useful when you take over a role. One of the first things you think about you know, <laughs> do the mission statement. Yeah, it's always useful. There, there are some stated mission statements. I know we're over. But <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, team. Till the next time. Cheers. Okay, team. Just a couple of bits and pieces uh, from that. Um, we agreed to produce a report on the VES. I know this wasn't the main focus of what we're doing today, but I would like you to consider if we could agree how we'd like to structure the evidence on this issue and whether we should be thinking about a formal inquiry, whether that's appropriate or not, bearing in mind what we've heard about the VES. Um, to be quite frank, uh, yeah, okay, he might have done the sums and realised that it, as far as the civil service it didn't matter, but one of the questions we had was about agency staff, uh, temporary staff, uh, morale, what was there, what was this, and I didn't feel as if we got any of the answers there. Are we content to move on to the next stage and do a more formal inquiry on the VES? Well, sure. Sorry for my, uh, my, my only question would be: Could we have, a, in order to agree to it, it would be helpful to have a sense of resource, how much that would impinge on our? I think we will factoring in consideration of um, functioning of government bill. Brexit related matters, which will come to this committee in part. Various other financial things around, yeah. you know, fiscal council. We're we're going to have a, a budget number three bill. This is an important issue, but I suppose my question would be, are we confident that we have the time? I think we should be looking at rolling the VES 
um, into the whole issue of public sector reform, which is something we do need to look at, regardless of the pressure on the other pieces as well. So, with your approval, I would like to take the work we've done on the VES and then move that, migrate that into a much more a formal piece of work that we need to do in public sector reform, because there's no way that um, we can allow this to. It, it needs to be properly scrutinised, and we're the committee to do that. If we're content to do that, Sean, happy. I would, can I also can I can I make a, uh, hopefully what is a constructive suggestion for us to to think about and to maybe perhaps leave with the clerk, which is that the um, in the next couple of weeks, the um, Northern Ireland Audit Office is going to publish a report on something a little bit like what we've just been talking about, capacity and capability in the civil service. Uh, Public Accounts Committee would then be considering that report, um, so it would be, I think, wise for us to. Make sure we're dovetailing with that. I have to declare an interest. I'm also a member of the Public Accounts Committee, but so that our when's that due, Matt? Uh, October, I think, was the last thing that Kieran Donnelly said. Um, I don't know exactly what the, it was due to be. In the, it was due to be this week, I think, actually, but it'll be in the next few weeks. Well, let's. If it, I'll put a proposal out there that we put this into our sort of work program, yeah. but we wait until we see what the outcome is from the. Uh, PAC's report. So it's NI. It's NIO report. NIO. Yeah. NIO report. We content with that. Okay. Uh, next one is: um, Would we wish to commission a raise to provide a res uh, provide research in the OECD recommendations and look for further evidence? Uh, again, I'm sorry to dive in again. I think. I mean, yes. I th in the sense that the, I mean, the OECD report is anyone who f fancies. Being a geek for a while, it is a brilliant. It is an excellent, thoroughgoing, 500-page look at things. From the, you mean the 2016 one? Um, it's very good. It's very, it's very thoroughgoing and it considers lots of stuff in really techy detail. But again, I think it should be linked in with. So I suppose my suggestion is that we, if we commission race to do something on it, we ask them to consider it in the context of ESRD and NAO. NIAO report. That's the proposal I would yes, make. Sorry. Yeah. So, look, look, we're going to be quite. We're going to be very busy. What with Jim's bill, and also sooner or later, somebody might actually produce the main estimate, estimates for us to have a look at. Um, so, we're going to be quite busy up until sort of the late autumn, and then there's going to be various other things to kick in, which will give time for these other reports to, to reports to come through. But I propose that we would look to, uh, to look to do that after that. We've, we've seen the evidence of that as well. Um, the other question is, um, and I think that was an interesting point about uh, Sean about arms length bodies, and I, I thought it was an interesting reply when they didn't really seem to think that the arms length bodies seemed to be part of the public service, which I thought was I know it, that wasn't the intent of which Bill intended it, but it did sound a bit. If you're going to do a reform of the civil service and approach the way we do business and the culture of it, it has to be everything it includes that as well. So I just think that maybe we could look at sort of a review of when we're looking at the evidence sessions of the lessons from RHI and reviewing the arms length bodies. Could we look at that in the forward work program? But if we're content, we'll take that and put that in. Happy. Okay. Move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, we're into the post evidence deliberations on the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. Uh, the agenda items are recorded by Hansard. Clark's briefing paper is at page 36, provides the committee with a number of points to consider during its deliberations on each clause of the bill and the amendments proposed by the bill's sponsors. This provides us the opportunity to identify and consider options of which members may wish to vote when it comes to formal clause by clause consideration of the bill. Uh, uh, Remind members that the updated bill folder is available in SharePoint. Uh, I'm just, uh, you'll give me uh, an indulgence for a minute while I bring it up in a, a second. And uh, inform uh, members, uh, table at page 89 is the notice of amendments, tabled to the 22nd of September for the consideration stage. Advise members that they should refer to the notice of amendments during the deliberations of each clause and subsection. So, Jim, how would we like to do this? You want to read off the clauses as we go through, as we need to consider them? Well, Chair, I think it's less formal than that, but at this stage, what I want to say firstly is, a, in relation to the briefing paper that members have, a, a 
apologies, uh, my. Yours has gone at the same stage as mine has. You should just shut down on me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't open mine. But uh, in relation to clause uh, 1 5, from memory, uh, in the briefing paper, it states that there are currently four special advisors uh, above the grade 5 maximum. That should have read that there are currently four special advisors above the pay band 2 maximum. So that's, a, that's an error in the paper. So apologies to members for that. So it's it. Sorry, Jim. This is point fourteen. So clause one five. So four spads. It should say uh, above the pay band two maximum for special advisors. But all below grade five. All below grade okay. five. Okay. I don't know what happened here. I'm Just wait until you get your system back up. Mine, is, you want mine dropped it. Um, <laughs> if you crack off while we try and get the IT working. Yes, absolutely. So I suppose just to follow on from the, the meeting last week, um, my role here is just as the bill clerk is to assist the member in deliberations. And really the purpose of today is just to go through the individual clauses of the bill. Um, and uh, the chair will lead you through those deliberations and consider what the key issues are in each of the clause. If the committee has a view on, on these key issues, if the committee requires more information um, to, to enable them to form a view, uh, what information that is. It's not clause by clause. You're not being asked to vote on the clauses at this stage. You're just simply, as a committee, being asked to take a view. If there are differing views within the committee, they will be reflected within the committee report produced by the clerk at the end of the committee stage of the bill. Could I just ask, when will we do the clause by clause? Well, that'll be entirely a matter for the committee. It, it depends on what the committee decides uh, today and possibly next week. There may be further evidence that, that members may wish to take before they, they, they decide to look at this more formally, or they may, may wish to take advice uh, as members consider each of the uh, clauses and subsections. Can I ask, so just further to Jim's question, which it, it, this is possibly, I don't mean to be fast side, but it would, would it be helpful if the clerk was able to give us, or actually yourself was able to give us a from here kind of overview of the stages and our role so that everyone who's, uh, we've all been following, following this closely and uh, Jim has kept us abreast and we've had very useful evidence sessions, but I just wonder would it be helpful to get an overview of where we go from here? Did we not get that last week? Yeah, we did. We did. I know. Yes, yeah. indeed. But I'm. But I, I don't. We don't have to. We, we don't have to spend too much time on it. I'm, I'm I think. I think. Um, and uh, to take with my honourable friend from South Belfast approach, this is something that many of us are not completely familiar with, and we want to make sure that we do it right. I think was that summarising what you're about I, to I'm, say. I'm, I literally mean a kind of. A, given Jim's question about when are we, you know. When are we proceeding formally to clause by clause? It would just would be helpful for if someone was willing to re-summarise for us in the minimum number of words. And I realise I'm being uh, asking for um, be, to be treated like a primary school child, but that's. For you, Chair. Is it? Yep. Yes, please, Claire. Um, so no, it's very important, and it is very important because we are a legislative assembly that you know the committee charged with scrutinising this bill um, is doing it correctly. So. At this stage, you're just really doing the deliberations, and that's really where you're reflecting on the evidence that you've received to date. Once the deliberations are closed, and the committee stage of this particular bill has been extended until December, so you have up until then, um, and if necessary, an extension could be sought, but that's more so the exception. Um, but you just really, the, the important bit now is to ensure the deliberations are fulsome and that when it comes to commit, uh, clause by clause stage, that you're under, very clear on what it is that you're voting on. Um, the clause by clause just naturally follows after the committee delib deliberations. And that's um, really just going through each clause and voting on each clause. There's not as much discussion on the clause at that point. Generally speaking, you would like to have reached a view during the deliberations. And the clause by clause is simply where you're recording um, either by consensus or vote, what the committee's view on. The committee then considers a draft. The clerk will then draft the committee report, and that will be considered by the committee. And once the committee are content with the draft report, um, then the sponsor of the bill, he can decide on a date uh, for consideration stage of the bill. So the next then it goes on to consideration stage. Members have up until the 
uh, there is a deadline set for amendments just immediately uh, the week before committee stage of the or consideration stage of the bill. Apologies. And members may table amendment with the bill office up until the Wednesday before the consideration stage of the bill. So you can either agree committee amendments here today or you can come and table your amendments um, individually with the bill office or party amendments. That option is open to you. It then goes to consideration stage and following that there is further consideration stage of the bill. And then finally it, it culminates in final stage before it's it's passed on to the advocate and the Attorney General. Okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll make a start and we'll look first of all at clause one. And I think Jim, the most substantial change is that you've put in an amendment in is it uh, page one line fourteen where it's uh, 3A and section 8 for code for appointments. We got that in front of us, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> what page are we on? It's page, it's, page one, it's page one on the bell, which is page, uh, let's see, I've got that. 36. 86. Yeah. Have you all got a copy of this, which is the copies of the amendments? Chair, this is clause one, subsection mm. two. Yeah. yeah. I, think it's, I think the chair was at subsection three. Subsection three. Sorry, Chair, do you want to start with subsection two? Okay, so I'll start with subsection two. So clause one, sort of page one, line seven, uh, after two, it's insert B. We have to do the. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, that's that's on the the amendment. So clause one, uh, subsection two, is hierarchy of spads. That's one. Yeah. Could I just say the purpose of that section was to deal with the situation that emerged in RHI, mm -hmm. where a particular spad from the executive office was directing other spads in different departments. So the purpose of that clause is to allow only a hierarchy within the executive office, so that spads who worked a particular minister worked for that minister, not to some other spad. Yeah, I would agree strongly with that. There was one particular spad who was utterly dominant and had supreme power, not only of the Spads within the executive office, but any other spads that were shared by that particular party, uh, and they obeyed everything they were told to do by him. So I, I think it's absolutely right that, that no spad from one department should have any authority over a spad from another department, and I think that amendment is very appropriate. Paul? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, again, not uh, um, disagreeing with the, the sentiment of the clause and the part of the clause. I suppose the practicalities of that as it winds out through legislation, can I ask um, what that would mean in the real world with regards to interaction between spads? So you have a you have a finance spad who wants to liaise with uh, an executive spad or vice versa. Uh, and there's a, a meeting and there's guidance or advice, not necessarily instruction, but guidance and advice, how would that play out? And again, suppose the luxury of this committee here is that Jim's in the meeting. Mm. <laughs> the bill, bill sponsors in the meeting, so it's just to tease that out a bit more. Just well, well, it wouldn't impact on the easing at all. It's, it's refined to <coughs> a exercising power it's essentially is out of direction, so it wouldn't. You would expect this bad from yes. one department to another to discuss something, but you wouldn't have one telling the other, "This is the line your minister will take." That's what it's. That's what it, what it's directed at. But I think I think and um, sort of Jim sort of just pointed out the question is, I think one of the things we should be considering is whether. We believe there should be a hierarchy in SPADs, and if there is a question of a hierarchy, if there is not deemed to be a need for a hierarchy in SPADs, therefore, do we outlaw it if that 
aim within the, the legislation. That's the, that's the question. No, we're not outlawing the hierarchy within the executive office. No, we can't. Because but, but what we are outlawing is one, as RHI showed in my personal experiences, there was one SPAD who didn't consult. He gave orders to all the other staff who obeyed implicitly, and he used the authority of from, coming from the first minister to do that. And that was part of the problem that arose during RHI. He should never, that person should never have had that power and shouldn't have in the future. Okay. Sean? Yeah, um, our view is that it's no longer an issue as within the new codes. A SPAD is only responsible to a minister, and each minister has only one SPAD. Well, no, not in, not in the OFM, DFM. That's not the case. Well, we've been over the ground so often, but, you know, What's in the code is interesting, it's not binding. Hmm. And the question is, do we need to... The question is, the fundamental thing is, that as it reads through all this bill, and every time you read it, it's the question of, if we were following normal custom and practice, would we have needed the bill? The answer is, in my mind, no, we don't. But we've never followed normal custom and practice, which is the reason why we need to have the bill for legislation. And, and as it has been pointed out, by Jim as we've gone through. So it's not the question of should they be doing it, it's the question of how do we ensure it happens? Because that's what's gone fundamentally wrong. Sir Pat? Well, I'm going I'm sort of I'm going to go back into Animal Farm where all 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 are equal but some are more equal than others. That club, that closes that down. So yes. Paul? Yeah, I think we have to, and again, Jim will keep us right, but the, the clause Sean, permits... Sean, shout out if you... Oh, I can't look at the, the, the clause only permits there to be uh, one special advisor to exact power over another in, in the executive office. And in some cases, that may well be common sense. So in any walk of life, you usually have a foreman, you know, or, or someone there that would coordinate... Uh, so if you, have, if you have an office where there's three, two, four, whatever spads, more than one, put it like that, then chances are that they're all going to have their own specialisms and their own expertise. And, then, and in that case, you wouldn't have a hierarchy. Uh, but there may be a case that one or the other takes a lead. And in that case, there may be merit and, and it may well warrant a hierarchy. But, but this this clause allows that to take place yeah. within the executive office, so that's why I have no problems with it. But I'm, I'm teasing out the practicalities of it, and I, you know, I cert, I'm supportive of it. But uh, so rather than taking a vote, do we accept the view for it to be included? Yeah, I would be supportive of that. Yeah. Okay. I want to move on to the, the amendments then. Yeah. Sorry, just to the chair. Uh, <coughs> When you ask that question, do we accept the view of one? Uh, it's basically a post bill in the first instance. Uh, then I don't accept that view. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and I know that will be my position as we go through uh, each individual clause and that as well. Yeah. But can I make that clear we'll say, from the outset? Um, you, uh, oh, but it's, if, it's, if your view, if you're dissenting to the entire bill, so yeah. therefore you're dissenting to every clause. So let's we can take we, we can we can <laughs> take we can take that as you can we can either take it as red money, or you can sort of yeah. interject at every point. But that's, that's basically because I, I make the point again too is whether we have legislation or whether we have a code of practice, and I believe in the code of practice. Yeah, I think I think chair to be, uh, for clarity, what what we're looking at here is pinning down what exactly the committee is going yes, to be. be considering when it comes to forming a view on the bill and at that stage members. Yeah. And the question is, yeah. are we content that this is part of the what we're going to consider as part of the bill? No. With standing fast what your what your view is, Belisa, which is no you don't believe in the bill in the first place, but yeah, yeah we got we've, yeah, we've, we've got that. Yeah, this is not formal clause by clause, so yeah. we, we sh no one should feel pressurised to say to say yeah or nay or whatever. It's just it's it's making sure that every member of the committee is ex knows exactly what a clause does. Yeah. Um, you know. The other thing I would stress is these deliberations are, are good for the Assembly as a whole. You are one committee and a number of members charged with looking at the bill. When it comes to consideration stage, the Assembly will look at the committee report on the bill and they will use that to inform them going forward with committee stage. So um, 
if members have differing views and that's uh, entirely acceptable, then the, the clerk then would take the opportunity to reflect those differing views in the report and, and the explanation or the reason or rationale for those so that other members can be informed of why members support particular clauses or, member, or amendments or why members have differing views on them. So the point of this is to, I suppose, you can record those and express the views to aid and assist the, the Assembly as a whole. Yeah. What should we do again? So uh, I think there are there are a number of amendments to this subsection. So if uh, members want to, it's just one. So there's just one to um, the typographical. Ah. But in B. So it's a. But oh yes. So um, yeah, it's uh, basically a technical amendment. So if members are content to. Look at that amendment as part of its view. Or if any members anything further would like to say on that? Any comments? Just a, it's a, an essential amendment to tidy it up. That's just okay. Right. Do we want to do the next amendment? Sorry. Uh, moving on to cl uh, clause two then, Chair. Yep. Right, do you want to look Sorry, clause one, one subsection yeah. two. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Right. I don't know it, I Sorry, don't subsection know three. Yeah. <laughs> I don't Apologies. Know it, I don't know if it helps, Chair, but if nobody objects, I'll give a, a two sentence overview of what it's about. Yes, please. Yes. It's about making special advisors subject, because they are civil servants, to the civil service code disciplinary processes. Mm -hmm. Do we have a. I would be supportive of that view. Next. And there is uh, one amendment here, is there? Yes, there is two amendments, maybe. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, two. Uh, well, yeah, three A and three B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's to make, it's to make the flow of it more clear. And it is to take out the words, it did say there can be no ministerial involvement or interference. It was pointed out quite correctly that the nature of the relationship would make it very hard to say there can be no ministerial involvement. Yeah. But what there can't be is ministerial interference. Yeah. So I've diminished it to no, in, no ministerial interference. Mm -hmm. That's interference in the disciplinary process. Right. So it's leave out involvement, put in interference. Okay. I, is that a game, section two? One, three. Three. Three A. Clause one, section three A, last sentence. Okay. And then the next bit is um, again in clause one, section three A, where that is replacing the current section and then moving it into call for appointments after subsection one. Have we got those words? Uh, just uh, from a technical framing perspective, uh, it would be a new subsection four in effect. The other it's just from a technical framing. We call it one three uh, a, but it actually would be a new subsection four. So it would be one four. There is a four there already. So we can't label it one four, but it would be a new subsection. So four. this is this is amendment four. I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. This is intervie introducing a new subclause. Yeah. When I first drafted the bill, I anticipated that the old code provisions about the appointment of special advisors. Would that, which said that the minister had to consider a pool of candidates, etc., would continue, because there had been a lot of criticism from Lord Justice Cochrane that that had been ignored. But of course, then when the finance minister and the executive produced the new code of appointments, they dealt with that criticism by simply stripping all that out. Mm -hmm. So putting it back in. So I am seeking to put that back in on the back of the evidence that we heard from the former Commissioner for Public Appointments, and it therefore requires the creation of a job description, a, a specification, the requirements for the post, uh, a candidate pool, and to retain the documentation. All of those were in the old code. So yep. it doesn't seem to me appropriate that we should be retreating and diminishing what was in the new code uh, in order to remove things which served a useful purpose. 
and that's much more in line with HR process Absolutely. as well, and Absolutely. also protects the special advisor. Yep. Or yep. So that's a new subclause into section one. Claire, have you got which particular subclause number that's going to be? So that's going to be four. So that that would be uh, one clause one subsection four. There is a subsection four in there, but if the amendment gets passed, then we would we'll renumber the, the, the subsections automatically. So. Okay. Are we content to take a view on that? Uh, again, Chair, just on the practicalities of that, and I, I, I hear what Jim says about it was in before, and you know that's how spas would have been appointed in the past which is probably uh, a reassurance. Uh, but again, I have a problem. For someone like me who wants to inject co-design into our system much greater and to try and get the best minds up here uh, involved, um, I, I think that you would want to leave, if you had a particular department that you want the expertise on, You'd want to try and keep the job description as, as broad as possible in case you ended up getting a, a very mighty mind coming in that you maybe hadn't accounted for before. So and again I'm sure I'm sure there's not a, a large pull of people out there who now aspire to be spads, to be fair, given the given the bad press that we've had over the years. So as I would well, be, this I, isn't prescribing what should be in. The job description. It's just simply saying there must be a job should description. Be a, yeah. So that, that's probably why I'm reassured and happy enough. But I suppose it's good to yeah. tease these things out, and that's why I'm, I'm speaking. I suppose to to have a to show them my mindset as we go along, uh, and to express the view and broaden that mindset and think process out thought process out to the rest of the committee. Um, I'm certainly not against this just to tease those th the and, and Jim, you might like to comment on it, but I would be of the view that if you were a special advisor mm. and you were seeking employment and you were selected and things went badly wrong fairly early on, you wouldn't have, unless you had the sort of the normal HR processes behind you, you wouldn't have any sort of real grounds to stand on. And if you were selected on even the broadest outlines of essential and desirable criteria, and those that information was retained, and I think normally between six and nine months after the event, that would again give a degree of protection for the special advisor, and and again would bring it more in line with sort of uh, civil service um, HR rules and regulations and codes of conduct. Yep. And it would also protect the minister hmm. in the event that something like that happened as well, because it would then be um, there would have been some form of due process which they could fall back on if it was challenged. Yep. So I think I would be content to take that view and take that view on that. Happy. Uh, next is uh, clause one again, page two, line nine, uh, and you're taking out the word advisor and insert by reason of holding of that post. So there's clause one five before that, chair. There's no oh, amendment to it. Uh, yeah, the existing clause one four yeah. is. is Maybe it's a bit tautologist, maybe you don't really need to say it, but it puts it beyond doubt that if you make an appointment that fails to adhere to the code, then the appointment's of no effect. It's really to underscore the fact that you must apply by the code. You must live by the code. Yep. Okay. And one five then is the um, uh, is the salary one. Again, if I can share on that on the salary one, I suppose that's where I would worry about the whole uh, brightest and best minds come into here. Remember that if, if if this place was working and functioning properly, a spad should really only be in post for a very limited space of time. Not like a civil service in that sense, where you would look at career progression and promotion. So I suppose I. I worry about pricing people out of the pool and pricing people out of the market. So let's say for education, say education minister, if you're wanting an educationalist uh, from uh, like a principal, vice principal, or whatever, there is probably no way that someone would leave a secure job unless we're going to get a comment uh, to come to work for a minister who may well only be in post for a term at the most. 
Um, so again, I, I'm, 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 I'm struggling with this part uh, with regard to what we would set in legislation, uh, a, a pay grade not, exceed, not exceeding. Um, uh, again, to me, out in the public sector, it's demand, you know, it's a market, and you pay the best minds. And if we're talking about co-design in this place and bringing in the brightest minds, we may well just be pricing ourselves out of good calibre. And but isn't it the question, and sorry, Jim, I'll bring you in in a second, when we're looking at specifically the recruitment of a special advisor and the role of a special advisor, it's the political aspect of it. If you were bringing somebody in to, let's say, who was an uh, expert civil engineer, you wouldn't be bringing them in as a, a special advisor. You'd be bringing them in, you would be going outside for consultancy or normal recruitment process. And the minister has that capacity to do that. That's not a political role. That's a, you need external evidence to do that. So the question here is about a political advisor who's being employed and where would they sit within the hierarchy of the structure. I think it's interesting because we've recently had the spat about sort of MLA staff salary. But the most interesting thing to me was not the fact the MLA staff salary had gone up, was the fact of where it was linked to roles within this building here and the skill levels that are attributable to it. So actually saying a political special advisor is led to a particular level within the civil service. I think and I hear what you say, Paul, but if you know, if I was if I was go a special advisor is a political special advisor. Mm -hmm. It's not somebody I'm bringing in to uh, change hospitals or change something else. That's not really their role. So I think my view, and I don't know what everybody says, I think you have to tie it to somewhere. And assistant secretary grade five. What's the salary of assistant secretary grade five? Grade five is somewhere in the region of eighty thousand, just over a chair, yeah. as far as I Check here. Yeah. Yeah. Just to explain, uh, I wanted to put that in because there was considerable scandal in the past where overnight, we're talking back about 2012-13, the special advisory salary was hiked from 70000 to 90000 mm -hmm. through the First Minister and the then Finance Minister, Sammy Wilson, agreeing it between themselves, some would say on the demand of SPADs. And then when the assembly went out of existence in 2016, I think all but one of the spads were at the top end in terms of within their bands. So the thing had the appearance of not being right, which is why I thought it would be sensible to link it to a senior civil service grade. Paul's point about what if you need an expert, yes. If you need a particular expert, there's two ways of doing it. I suppose you make a business case through and make an appointment within the department. Or the Civil Service Commissioner's order allows the First and Deputy First Minister to make a particular appointment, as they did with David Gordon. Yeah. Now, of course, when you come to Cause 3, I want to change that, not to deny them the right to do that, but to cause, if they do do it, to subject it to the approval of the assembly. So, if you needed a particular engineering whiz kit or whatever, uh, you could have the appointment made under that, subject to the assembly's approval, and that would be capable of setting its salary at whatever it thought. Okay, Jim. Well, uh, Paul said that in an ideal world, um, the spads only be. A there for a particular period. We had two spads here, here for 17 years. And what simply happened was when one minister fell or resigned or retired, they were simply passed on to the next minister. The king is dead. Uh, when? The king is dead. Oh, the the king. Spad. They were simply passed on. <laughs> so remember, we have a different structure to any other democracy in, in, in the United Kingdom. It's quite normal in Westminster that if a spad is appointed to, say, the minister for pe work and pensions, when that minister resigns or retires, the SPAD goes with him. Yeah. He, he, he or she becomes unemployed. That doesn't happen in our system. The SPADs are recycled round and round. Uh, so so they, they have very high salaries, and they were extraordinarily high salaries we were paying our SPADs, was meant to reflect uh, a, a volatility which didn't actually exist. 
It's very unusual in any Western democracy for a SPAD to last 17 years in any post. Secondly, we didn't seem to have any problems recruiting and retaining SPADs on the salary we were paying them. Indeed, from my memory, in certainly my own party or my own former party, I can only think of one SPAD who voluntarily left, and he left to become a, a judge, which was a very well position, and a good SPAD he was too. So, so therefore, it's quite clear the market is telling us we have no problems whatsoever in retaining and attracting SPADs. I mean, in the Northern Ireland context, uh, starting at the bottom of a scale at £70,000 is not a small salary. And we had the obscenity, uh, as Jim said, actually it was £92,000. Mm. This salary was increased to at a stroke of a pen. And many of us believe that that was at the instigation of one particular SPAD who felt that he wasn't being paid well enough. And he was a super SPAD, a, 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 a complete control freak who ran everything. And he demanded 92000 The other factor is, should there be a fall of the Assembly, they get 50% of that <laughs> as a compensation payment. Uh, first £30,000 of it tax-free. So therefore, there is a safety net for those who may fall in those circumstances. So it was an extraordinary attractive package, which brought a lot of derision from the public. And I think Jim actually has been very generous here. Sorry, could I get a bit of a guidance? How could somebody be getting 50% of their... Salary. They got it as a compensation if they lost their jobs as part due to the dissolution of the assembly. But surely they would be entitled to the normal remuneration and you know, like one month's salary. Oh yes, they got that in addition, but they got a lump sum payment. In fact, those were published. I have them. Yeah. And uh, the, the three. The it's two, in their terms and conditions. Yeah, the two senior spads that I'm aware of got forty-five thousand plus pounds each for when the assembly collapsed in 2016. And that was, that's in the public domain, those figures. So, therefore, uh, there is a very good safety net for them. In a spad. So, yes, I think we all took up the wrong profession. And then, well, of there course, was one spad chair who got the handshake and became an MLA. And then spent. an MP, yeah, no, yeah. And, of course, some of those spads then returned to their position when the uh, Assembly returned. So, I, I, I think the public won't wear anything more generous than this, uh, and I think... Because of our special circumstances, we should never be going above 70,000 a year. Okay. Matt? Um, I. Um, Are you an interest to declare? I have no interest to declare. I was just a little short. <laughs> and I've, I've never been a special advisor in Northern Ireland or at Westminster. Um, uh, I have some sympathy with, with Paul's point. I, I suppose it would be helpful to get from the bill sponsor a sense of whether he thinks. I don't want to misquote the, the specific clauses of the bill or the amendments, but whether the desire to so whether the the general desire that that more appointments be made on merit is in tension with his acknowledged view, if it is your acknowledged view, to tell us and, and others jump in that these are inherently political roles, therefore they are they sort of exist in a separate sphere, which is so for example, if you are recruiting for a special advisor serve the Ulster Unionist Party for the sake of argument that um, that in that context it is very difficult to hire someone it's difficult to draft terms and conditions which include a um, uh, uh, specificity around sympathy with the political aims of the Ulster Unionist Party. Do you see what I mean? Is there a tension there? Well, if there is, it, it never stood in the way of anyone heretofore, because when you had terms uh, which required someone to be to meet certain uh, basic requirements. Uh, it was more that it, it wasn't just coincidence, I'm sure, that in all parties the people appointed were acolytes of the party. Um, so I don't think that is a problem. But the question about the salary is... Like, I, I'm not opposed to spads. I think spads are necessary. I think they do a good job. Is this evil? But I think that there were excesses which, from a public perception, we need to see to address. And I think when you got to a situation where a spad could be earning more than a minister. Going out, yeah. 
there was something that needed to be addressed. So by pick, pitching it at grade five, I thought, you know, that's that's the sort of level civil servant this man's rubbing shoulders with, working with very often, and that's a generous apportionment to them. Would it be would it be that your view that I know mean, this is not how we're exactly considering, but in, in relation to specifically the clause around um, terms and conditions and job uh, the job description clause that were at a foreseeable or a desirable outcome for that of, of that if that became law is that so we really need to talk um, about, um, there would be a material change in the number of people who were party sympathisers who got those jobs you, is that some, an end you would like to see or is that, is that the intention of the bill to be more accurate? No, I don't think that's the intention. I, I think there'd be an uplift in quality if that were so. But I think the reality is that you're not going to have Sinn Féin appoint a DUP supporter, DUP appoint a Sinn Féin supporter. Like that's the reality of life. Uh, and I think, given the particular <coughs> relationship between minister and SPAD and the political nature of it, it'd be unrealistic to expect that. Yes. Um, so I'm not, I'm not trying to drive out politicos out of um, its bad positions. I'm just trying to rein in what the, uh, that there's a, a defensible level of salary We've just got one more to do. and a process of appointment. So it's not, just, it's not just seen as if to be someone picks their mate or picks this one or picks that one just because of who they are. They have to have some qualities. Um. Sure. Sort of just, 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 just through, uh, no, just through the moment. Uh, I've just been informed that uh, we're being time compressed again, and I think this is very important that we actually take the time to go through this in detail. The significant issue is, I think, Jim, we're looking at clauses, the ones that are going to take a lot of time for, for us to discuss through in T through our sort of clause eight and clause eleven, where we're going to have to specifically look at sort of tariffs and the oh, yeah. likelihood and the rest of it. I think. One of the things, and having had a review of this, one of the things we might want to do is have independent, just legal opinion from the uh, from here, particularly on the issue of tariff, because I understand the um, qual no the no the chair. If you want, to, uh, if you want to finish with clause one first, and then you can maybe move on to clause nine and clause eleven next week. Uh, no, sorry, uh, having finished with clause one, I think we're at clause one. Subsection five at this yeah. stage. Yeah. yeah. So if you do clause one, subsection five, clause one, subsection six, and then, we can and then perhaps consider that before considering maybe the other. Is that right? Okay. Because we've got an SR to so, do so, so as well. I, I, I understand Matthew's point, and I think there is, uh, it has merit. But I think at the end of the day, you have to decide: Does the assembly want to have any cap? On, SM, on SPAD pay. If they want to have cap, what's the right cap? Um, I think there's two different issues. Who should be appointed and how should, what should they be paid? Well, I think there's a, there is a broad, much broader debate to, to have, and we may have it in this committee, we may have it in the floor of the Assembly, about, in general, since we raised the point, actually, I would say there are some of what um, Jim W has been talking about our structural issues around the way our spads work, and I think the bill clearly makes some some welcome move towards improving the structure of how those the special advisors work. It, strangely, although my you know my party has had a numerically much fewer and uh, in sort of politically much less influential group of spads over the last Better decade. Behaved. Sorry. And better behaved as well. Well, you might say that I couldn't possibly comment, Jim. I wasn't here to to know whether, but but actually. You know, having worked with a lot of spads, both Labour and Conservative, in my previous life, I wouldn't necessarily assume the quality of spads in Northern Ireland is necessarily that much lower than the special advisors <laughs> that have floated around Whitehall of all parties, to be and Liberal Democrat as well. To be perfectly honest, um, now the quality of our MLAs versus is a, is a different debate that we're probably we could have somewhere else. But anyway, okay, Pat, you want to come in very shortly? Well, it's just with, with the point that you were making. I believe that we were coming back to this and going through it clause by clause as well. I mean, I thought if anyone, my, my reading of it was that if we did have a, a clause or we had something that we wanted to change, I mean, maybe it's the time to bring it directly, maybe just to the bill sponsor himself. 
Uh, I mean, I, I read through it. Only, only, I was looking for one. I read down one last night, 5A, but now I can't find it. But only 5A, right, because I believe that's a new part which Jim has introduced just himself. Absolutely. Well, I was just looking for any guidance on that. But if we're going to go through all of this now, that's, that's right. But we shouldn't be going through it all now. That's the point hmm. I was going to make, Chair. Yep. So. We, 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 the committee must. If the committee is going to do a report, and if yeah. a we need to, we need to take a view yeah, on. Yeah, the we have to. We have to go through this. Yes. Like yeah. this. Uh, we? But the, it's the time allocated for us to do this now. No. Am I going to sit down now? Because if you tell me that, that's great. I'm going to go for it now. But I don't want to start all of this and then find that we're rushed out. What is our time Apparently, we're being booted out of here by the uh, executive committee at uh, three o'clock. Can we meet somewhere next week where we don't have that problem? Or there isn't yeah, the same uh, time constraints next week as there are this week? But I'd suggest that the chair is to, to yeah. finish up in clause one. Do you do that? Yeah. issues to bring up in clause nine yeah. and clause eleven that needed yeah. further investigation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, let's try and finish clause one. Yeah, yeah. that's because of, sorry, what more we've got left to do in clause one. Uh, so uh, it's currently clause one, five. subsection five. Subsection five. Which is, is what members have been discussing. It's the pay. Okay, I, the pay. I should just make one point. The, the, the specifics of the pay are set out in the codes. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not trying to specify in the bill, here are the bans. No. I'm simply saying, here's, here's the, the saving. Ah. Yeah. Code, work it out as you like. Yeah. Yeah. Very reasonable. Okay, let's take a view on that one. And then that. Does that tick us the end to? No, there's no six. One six. six, six, one. six. There's no part of one. Yep. What well, one six is the vax matter that arose in the RHI inquiry, where when someone, uh, when some persons were disqualified by virtue of the special advisers bill of 2013 because of criminal convictions, etc. Uh, that nonetheless the civil service accommodated them as effectively super spads overseeing others in Stormont Castle. And the purpose of 1.6 is to make it unlawful for that to happen. And I think the most critical point is that the permanent secretary must ensure that no person other than a duly appointed special advisor is afforded by the Department the cooperation recognition facilitation due to a special advisor. By reason, by reason of holding that post, that I think is something that's very necessary. But that's what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. I have no problems with this. I have no problems with this aspect because it's all about the role, of transparency, and accountability. Well, well, there was no such thing as super spads. Only official spads. This was a, I think, creation for somebody to sell a book. But in the, in the report. It was in the the report. RHI report. And, and if there was no unofficial spots, if there were no shadowy figures, then this clause and this bill won't have an effect. That's right. There's nobody any harm. You'd welcome it. But I think if you go to volume three of the RHI report, page 158, yep. you will find two paragraphs dealing with the subject. But, as Paul rightly says, if there are no shadow figures, then there will be no work for that clause to do. We can tend to take that view. Okay. In. okay. So right. Were there two amendments to uh, Yes, there was one amendment that I read in there that the... Um, the, I can't remember who it is, somebody who gave evidence thought there was a lack of clarity that it could apply to a civil servant as well. So I added a no facilitation except for due to a special advisor by reason, by reason of the holding of that post. Yeah. Make clear. Yeah. Civil servant uh, Pacific. And then in. I got his own amendment there. Yeah. Yeah. Are we content? 
I think there's possibly one other amendment of one two, but um... uh, yes, it had to be degenderised because they yeah. talked about him. Oh, that's right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Line Just right. Female spads. Nine twelve. Okay, uh, I will take as I will take as action for chairs next week that we have more than sufficient time to go through the rest of it. Here, here. I think being compressed in this time ways is not conducive to good scrutiny. Chair, it can be the first substantive item on the agenda for next week. Yeah. There may not be any oral evidence sessions next week. Well, that's then let's then yes. uh, make that so. Better. Can we make that so? Are we content? Yep. Yeah. Okay, team. Bearing in mind our. Uh, the desire of the executive committee to chuck us out. Claire, thanks very much indeed, and uh, thank okay. you. Sorry, are you, so we're not doing the, the two tariff-related clauses. No, in case you need to give guidance to. Oh. No. Clause nine and clause eleven. No, clause nine and eleven. We'll do that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the issue with clause nine and clause eleven. We might want to take an independent legal opinion yeah. on the not whether we take a view on whether there should be a. Uh, criminal offence, but the level of the tariff of the criminal offence. I think that's the how we how we're looking at. Yeah, wh why are we thinking like that? Because we had a didn't we have a response from the Department of Justice and also. I think from sure, if, if members want to commission that today, it would be it, it yeah, would speed things up. But I think the the issue uh, was that a uh, the view of the a. Uh, Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Uh, Did the Department of Justice have something to say? And also the Department of Justice. Okay. So it's a to get independent legal advice that a that basically the provisions are commensurate with the relevant articles within the uh, uh, European Convention on Human Rights. Well, I think uh, through, through you, I would remind the clerk that I have amended yep. the tariff in Clause 11. Uh, the issue was taken with it being five years by the Department of Justice. I have amended that down to two years. That was based on what the Department of Justice's based issue was? Based on what they were saying and what the human rights people were saying. So I'm just wondering. Well, we'll consider it, we'll consider it more detail. Uh, like the point I make to you is you either have a solely summary offence or you have a summary plus a high court, or plus a crime court offence. The advantage for the accused of having a, what's then called a hybrid offence, it can go either court, is it gives the accused the right to have a jury trial. Yep. If you simply have a summary trial, then you don't have a right to a jury trial. Yep. And it seemed to me it was more beneficial for an accused to have a jury trial or have that option, but you couldn't have less than two years in a crime court yeah. penalty. Okay. That was the issue. Right. Well, we'll consider that again next week. OK. Clear. Thank you very much, today. Thank you. Uh, Tim, you've got to sort of motor on here. Uh, can I bring you on to the next item on the agenda, the SL1, Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restriction and Forfeiture Relative Period. Uh, could I draw your attention to the clerk's briefing note on page 42? Uh, the SL1, Business Tenancies, Coronavirus Restriction and Forfeiture Relevant Period, Amendment Number 2, Regulation 2020, on page 43. I'd like to inform members that Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 provides that a right of re-entry or forfeiture under a relevant business tenancy for non-payment of rent may not be enforced. Relevant period is defined in as the period starting with royal assent and ending from 30 September 2020. This new draft world would extend the relevant period of Section 83 of the Coronavirus Act to 31 December 2020. The regulations are subject to the negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. This is the Committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1. It is not possible to amend this once the regulations have been made and led at the Assembly Business Office. The comment I have had and have discussed with the, um, uh, the clerk earlier on is this takes us up to the 31st of December 2020. Yet I understand going through Westminster at the moment there's legislation that's ticking up to the end of the financial year. So the question is, uh, bearing in mind it's being laid before us for the 31st of December 2020, should we be considering looking for its extension out to the end of the financial year? Good. Because I'm pretty certain that's the direction of travel we're going on. So, if we are content, I would like to go back and say, no, we would wish to see this extended out to the uh, end of the financial year. 
rather than sort of the end of December. Yes. I would like them. Yeah. Yeah, Chair, we can do that, but, but we can only really assess the SL1 in front of us, isn't that right? Yeah, we can. But again, this is our opportunity to say like, we need it. We should be going back and saying it should be extended on to the end of the financial year. If we don't, um, uh, disc- if, we do, if we don't agree to it, we're we're at risk of it not of it not becoming of not being law of the of it falling. The, but if it's we the oh, just uh, just a further pause point, yeah. But it, it, but bearing in mind, I agree. It could be it could be, it could be uh, look, we need to take advice on it, but it could be brought back. But the fact is that we already like a lot of these pieces of legislation, there are sort of progr- this has already been extended once. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. It should be extended. Sure. The, the, uh, this is the SL one stage. It is the committee's opportunity to provide input to yeah. the legislation. And when it comes to the actual yeah. SR, that uh, a the, the decision is whether to accept the SR or not. Now, even if the committee makes the suggestion to the department whether it agrees with it or, or not, would, in whatever form the SR comes, it would be then up to the committee to, to pray against it because yes. it is negative resolution. Yeah, it is by negative resolution. Mm-hmm. So, content? Agreed. Uh, moving on to chairperson's business. The Department of Finance has led its 2019 2020 annual report on accounts. In the business office, which the committee will consider at the meeting next week. Um, through the diligent work of the staff, uh, I would like to draw attention to one issue detailed in the report is in regards to land and property services, identifying a suspected misappropriation of 56 refunds by a staff member with a total value of 125,000 that seem to have gone into their own account. Um, we have had the Permanent Secretary in front of us in closed session, and without going into the details of the closed session, but there were significant issues that had arisen with LPS that she did not make us aware of that subsequently became quite clear the week after with the Northern Ireland Audit Office report. And I do not know about you, but LPS is rapidly running down to my bottom of my list of people that I am have a degree of confidence in. And I'm very surprised that it took one of our staff members who are particularly diligent, and can we pass on the, our thanks for the diligence of the staff and for finding that, I think it was Phil, or yes, sir. Um, that we haven't been informed of this. And this should be an issue that should be of interest to the Finance Committee, particularly on the governance and management of LPS. Is um, that person still in the employment? We don't have that degree of information. I, th- I think not, Chair, but if, if members want to consider it in detail next week, the uh, details can be provided. Yeah. I think I would like to get a report from the Perm Secretary on what is going on within the LPS. And I think at some stage, fairly soon, we should ask for the Permanent Secretary and the head of the LPS to come and present to the committee so that we are actually getting a more detailed overview of what's going on within LPS. I must admit I'm not particularly happy to pick that piece of information up. And I don't think and speaking I'm looking around the room here, I'm not saying there's any members of this committee here looking particularly happy about this either. Uh, thank you. Move on to the next order of business. Uh, moving on to correspondence. Uh, committee for procedures regarding standing order uh, 110 to 116 temporary provisions tabled at page 96. Members, have we any comments? <coughs> if we're content, members, for the proposal? Great. I can seek your agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence. Great. Uh, Can I seek your agreement to note the information request to the Department for routine papers circulated on the 18th of September 2020? Uh, If we move on to the forward work programme and inform the members of the draft forward work programme from September to December 2020 is at page 55. Inform members at page 60 is the clerk's brief on the Department of Finance main estimates position, which will be considered in the wider process of the main estimates at a future meeting. I understand we've been written to about the main estimates. 
Sir, this is in relation to the, the wider main estimates. This is, is just refers to the department's own main estimates. So, a, if members are content, there's a, a number of questions there suggested put it to the department. So, if members are content with that approach, uh, the other uh, just before the meeting, I got notification that a uh, the committee was expecting the main estimates uh, in oral evidence session on the 7th of October. The department has said that that will not now be possible. However. They have confirmed that the committee will get the, a copy of the main estimates at least one week in advance of an oral evidence session. So that should give sufficient time for adequate consultation, I suppose, in the context of what normally happens. Can I just, the Chair, so I'm sure the main estimates will be laid in the Assembly. As in, are they saying that? We're not getting a special sight of them over and above the rest of the assembly, are we? Yes, the, com the committee will get them one week in advance of the rest of, the, of them being publicly uh, laid. Uh, them being uh, laid from them. from memory, I think they, they will be laid possibly on the on the Friday afterwards or the Monday after the committee sees them. But then the committee will see them, or it, it may even be after that because the committee will see them on the at the meeting on Wednesday, well, it was intended Wednesday the 7th of October, yeah. so then it would be debated the following week. So the committee will see them in advance of them uh, being made available. So I think what they're saying is we're not going to see the main estimates on the 7th of October or any time that week. Okay. Uh, Jared, I, I think that the problem was that to bring them on, on the 7th of October would have meant squeezing the committee. So they're, uh, they've, they've said they're not going to squeeze the, the, the committee. The committee will receive them in time, and they've been pushed back at least a week. Um, but through the, uh, and I would just like to take your views on this. Uh, we've waited a considerable period of time for the main estimates. Um, we have waited a considerable period of time for information on spending rounds. And yes, we have heard time and again, and issues with additional money and funds coming in and the rest of it. But I think, as a committee, we need to take the time and be given the time to look closely at the main estimates before they are laid before the Assembly. We have waited close on, by my reckoning, three and a half months anyhow for the main estimates to come through. So I think if we can express back through the DLO and back to the Department that we want to have an adequate time to a look at the estimates before they are laid before and there can be no excuse of time pressures to get them pushed through in a particular period of time because we've waited a considerable period of time to get to where we are now. And if you're content for us to express that to the department. Agreed. Agreed. OK. Thank you. Um, next item is the, to seek response on issues raised in the paper to inform them. Done that. Thank you. Members, are we content with the forward work programme? Bearing in mind before I discuss today. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, have we any, uh, ladies and gentlemen, have we any other items of business? Can oh. I bring something up, Chair? And I suppose I should have, and I would have raised this at the the discussion around Jim's bill. Uh, and just out of courtesy, uh, I want to bring it to the attention of the committee members that I intend to consider uh, an amendment to Jim's bill. At the minute, there's a duty on the finance minister and indeed the executive to bring forward a bill. Uh, sorry, bring forward a budget by the 31st of March in a given year. Uh, I don't think that's good enough, considering the performance of finance ministers of late. And I believe that we should look at something that uh, places a duty on the finance minister to commence the budget process, process and then another duty to produce and publish and bring to the floor of the Assembly a draft budget in which would then trigger a 12-week consultation. Uh, still very primitive, but I, I just wanted to raise that with committee members out of courtesy. If any members, including Jim, of course, wants to come and discuss this with me and seek out my thought process on it, by all means do so. I'm also investigating what happens in Wales uh, and Scotland. Uh, but, of course, I would add this. There would have to be, I suspect, uh, a very good defence clause, uh, because with all, well, you know, to be fair, the finance minister isn't always a destiny, isn't in control of his own destiny with regards to what the Chancellor of the Exchequer does, and it would be silly to have 
a minister, a statutory duty on a minister to bring a budget uh, on the Monday, and then the Exchequer, Chancellor of the Exchequer, brings forward a UK budget on the Tuesday. So there will probably be a defence clause also to allow for uh, things to happen and for crisis to evolve. But, but again, I suspect would have on that defence clause the minister coming to the floor of the house to explain that. Uh, so that's my thought process, Chair. I just wanted to get out there as quick as I could, formally. Okay. So if any of you guys want to come speak to me, by all means, my door's open. June noted. Okay, and we have one order of business we'll have to conduct uh, off in camera just after this event. But uh, the next meeting will be uh, in here on 12.30 and looking for an extended time to be able to consider Jim's bill. And we go into closed session. Northern Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland.